so yeah, the wave optics actually provides a nice transition into quantum mechanics, because in quantum mechanics is where you continue to talk about waves. Now, there are some background materials that's been a while since you were tested on, so you should uh, make sure to review and you don't forget any of those background materials. Uh, quantum mechanics is one kind of exception where I do care about the history, how it was discovered. It sort of has to do with the fact that the, I don't know, quantum mechanics is messy and you kind of a way of kind of getting your head around it. So the important background experiment considerations that I want you to remember are, well, let me see if I can list them kind of in some coherent way. So there's the Planck law. I think that's the first thing where we had to start out with it because um, Planck law or black body radiation as that's as there. Um, it's the very first thing before you do anything because of Planck's constant. It's a, where Planck's constant was introduced. That's why it's called the Planck's constant. And um, Planck's constant, I guess I didn't maybe emphasize it too much when we first started. Um, neglecting speed of light. I think this is the first true, okay, never mind. Okay, it's one of the three <laughs> fundamental constants of nature. Gravitational constant, speed of light, Planck's constant. It applies to, well, it applies to everything, but whenever you see Planck's constant, it means quantum mechanical effect is now non-negligible. So whenever you see Planck's constant, it means it's now, you have to treat it quantum mechanically. Or um, put it another way, if you have something that is quantum mechanical and you don't see Planck's constant, and it's not embedded into something else like a Bohr radius or something else, then uh, you're probably missing something. Because if it's quantum mechanical, it must involve this in some place. And you can kind of see it embedded into the other two background material that I'll mention. So right after Planck's law, we have a photoelectric effect. And uh, one last thing I should mention is the models of hydrogen atom. So let's call it atomic model. So these are sort of key touchstones that you should understand uh, what quantum mechanical concepts were introduced in each of these. Photoelectric effect is the one that um, well, no, it does, didn't actually, it, it was actually part of Planck's law. And both the, as part of Planck's law and photoelectric effect, one thing that you eventually end up with, and it ends up being very fundamental relationship, which is why I'm now bringing it up again in this review, is the relationship between energy and frequency. So energy of something is fundamentally related to its uh, frequency by Planck's constant times frequency. And I guess I'm being vague. What do I mean by something? <laughs> um, so this would be the energy of the particle uh, representation of a wave. Then the frequency of that wave is related to the, the energy of the particle representation of the wave. Or this is the minimum quantum of energy that that classical wave can transfer. Um, and um, we have one more way of writing this as h bar omega, because as you will see when we get to Schrodinger equation, that factor of two pi comes up a lot. So people invent a quantity of h bar, h over two pi, reduce the Planck constant, and omega is the, the angular frequency instead of frequency. Um, so this was this idea was present even in Planck law because he was originally kind of postulating what if this um, quantum mechanic, what if these uh, uh, black body oscillators were only able to exchange en energy in the unit of H times F. And all of his derivation came from that. Einstein extended to apply to uh, light electromagnetic wave, something people thought they understood well. And as a part of explaining atomic model, this gets extended to everything. So laws of quantum mechanics is not some special law of black body radiation. It's not some special law of black body radiation. It's not some special law re relating to light. It's something that's universally, um, um, well, it's something, that, it's something that's universal. <laughs> so 
that expression is best, uh, uh, that idea is best expressed in De Broglie relationship, which relates the momentum of any physical object might have, that momentum, so momentum, anything that's, uh, uh, so any moving particles can have momentum, and electromagnetic waves also have momentum, as you probably should remember. That momentum is related to their wavelength, their wave property by Planck's constant divided by the wavelength. Or the way we prefer to express it when we are doing more serious math with it, h bar times the wave number k. So these are, uh, I write these in big letters because they are kind of important relationships that both kind of connect to your intuitive introduction to quantum mechanics and later on to detail the calculation in quantum mechanics. So, um, so that's kind of the background. I don't know what else did we do. Oh, there's the Compton effect. I probably should write it down. I could, did I ask you a Compton effect question in any of the exam questions? Yeah. I, I did, in the, oh yeah, where you use Compton formula, right? In exam two, yeah. So, um, yeah, so, Compton effect. It might just be stuck there, I don't know. It depends on how many relativity stuff I have to ask. <laughs> um, um, so, but Compton effect would be an illustration of the, really that you, you should treat, um, um, for, so you should treat light as particle because the kind of thing you see in Compton effect, it's very difficult to try to explain it in the kind of wave interacting with the charge of the particle. But if you treat it as a collision between two particles, then it all makes sense. Um, yeah, and I think I kind of want to um, include it under this heading of background, um, kind of trying to take this idea here now um, your textbook covers it in the next chapter, and you can do this uh, in a very calculationally rigorous way. But the idea that I want to kind of put under this heading is the uncertainty principle. Uncertainty principle. It's uh, both the idea, just the conceptual idea that uh, arbitrary precision is not possible. When you measure something arbitrarily precisely, then you have, you have to give us something else. And the concrete expression that um, is consistent with that and is um, uh, also rigorously correct all the time is the po momentum position uncertainty or position momentum uncertainty. When you localize a particle, meaning you have a non-infinite uncertainty in the position, then you must have non-zero uncertainty in the momentum. So that the product of position and momentum is the uncertainties are always greater than or equal to h bar over two. And let me give you this exact version in case you, know, you are asked to do the detailed calculation using wave mechanics. Then, um, so this was uh, one of your exam three thing. Um, your the Gaussian wave packet, it's one of those uh, minimum uncertainty states where you, when you multiply these two, you exactly get h bar over two. Um, the other example that I know of is the simple harmonic oscillator ground state. I think all the other states I know are not minimum uncertainty states. <laughs> um, so this is one, your textbook gives one more which uh, I have been kind of avoiding. Um, because um, there are ways to use it wrong. But let me write it down anyway. You should at least have the formula. Uh, I'm not gonna do much with it because um, it's a more fragile idea than this. So I don't wanna put too much weight on that idea. But it's the idea of that energy time uncertainty. That uncertain, there's, um, let's say you are measuring energy of some object um, or energy of, yeah, it's, uh, let me just write it down and not really say anything. Um, the approximately greater than or equal to h. I mean, it's actually h bar over two, but since I'm not giving you exact meaning of delta t and delta e, I, delta e I can, but delta t it's a little bit harder to, so let me just leave it here. Um, but you know, one thing that is related to this is that we'll cover here is the idea of stationary state, energy eigenstate, right? Energy eigenstates have infinite energy, not infinite, infinite um, precision in their determinant. They have the, they have very precisely defined energy, and that is tied to this. 
because energy eigenstates are stationary states, the amount of time that's available for you to measure the energy of the energy eigenstate is theoretically infinite. So you can determine the energy as precise, arbitrarily precise. Um, now, when you have mixture of the energy eigenstates, then it changes, yeah. Anyways, <laughs> so, but I want to just uh, put this uncertainty principle at a conceptual level because when you, when you understand and grasp this is when you can actually use this to make uh, various uh, different arguments. And this is something I want you to put on that additional problem set, which I didn't, so I can test you on it. Um, so relating back to the atomic model, you can use the uncertainty principle to argue that there's a minimum distance that electron can be from the proton. Because the idea is that as, um, as it gets closer to the proton, position uncertainty decreases, which means by this principle, momentum uncertainty must increase. So as the potential energy decreases, kinetic energy increases, there's some distance where those uh, two changes in energy are balanced, you get the minimum total energy. And that minimum distance happens to be uh, Bohr radius, if you kind of use the correct factors of two pi sen two. Um, so, but that won't be on your exam. Uh, it's an argument that I remember seeing when I was an undergrad, and it's very, um, use, uh, they're very uh, nice argument. Um, if I can post the, the uh, additional problems that I will, but as I said in the announcement somewhere, that uh, it'll be entirely optional. So. There will be no points associated with it, and um, um, I won't put this on the exam, even though I really want to, but I can't, because I didn't write up the solution. But, uh, but I want you to kind of see the usefulness of uncertainty principle from a more practical problem-solving aspect. Um, that's what I mean, conceptual level. All right, so good chunk of quantum mechanics, uh, which I really ought to cover in the next 10 minutes, so that we have time for the other stuff, which is really, um, I guess there is a less of a need to review this because we just covered it. So what are we reviewing? But um, we should have enough time to get to it. Um, so the rest of the quantum mechanics, I guess uh, it's really better covered as Schrodinger equation. Um, and as a starting point, I, this is how I introduced it, and this is how I still want you to remember it. So I'm not going to give you the differential equation on the first line, although I could, and there are upper division textbooks that start out with that approach, which is fine. But I want you to uh, first understand Schrodinger equation as uh, something that expresses an idea that's already familiar to you, idea of total energy as a kinetic energy plus potential energy. So um, uh, the mathematical kind of base here is the idea of operators. There's an energy operator that measures energy of a state represented by a function or vector or some mathematical object. And this object in the wave mechanics, this operator in wave mechanics is expressed by I h bar time derivative. And the reason it's time derivative kind of ties back to here. Energy is related to frequency. Um, and there's also momentum operator. The, it's a mathematical operation procedure that allows you to measure momentum of a given state. And this momentum operator is given by minus i h bar, the uh, position derivative. And the, it, the fact it's a position derivative is related to the fact that momentum is associated with the wavelength or the wave number. Okay. So these are a fundamental starting place for wave mechanics. That if you have some wave function f as a function of position and time, you can see, well, what energy does it have if it has any? What momentum does it have if it has any? And the Schrodinger equation expresses this idea that the total energy is equal to kinetic energy plus potential energy. And I guess you could do it relativistically correctly, but Schrodinger equation does it rel uh, non-relativistically. So 
the total energy rep is represented by this, I h bar. Um, oh, uh, actually, sorry, I need one more step. Um, so in terms of some state and the operators that are acting on the state, the way it would be represented. So well, I have some state for each of these terms. To get the total energy, I act on that state with the energy operator. To get the kinetic energy, I act on this state with a version of, with a combination of momentum operator that gives me the kinetic energy. That's the momentum squared over 2n. So momentum squared over 2n. Here squared means you act with this, um, you multiply with a different, different derivative operator twice, meaning you're taking two derivatives. Um, plus the potential energy, oh, I guess, um, so the position operator happens to be just multiplication by x. This is what we call position space. Uh, so here it's just whatever function of x is, the potential energy. So um, what you know as a time dependent to Schrodinger equation is, um, is this written out with this as operator in mind. So when you write this all out, you get the time dependent to Schrodinger equation. That I h bar time derivative of the wave function, time dependent wave function, function of position and time. Uh, when you square this, you get minus h bar squared, minus h bar squared over 2m, the double position derivative plus, well, this is just that, um, if we, in terms of x. So this is what we call time dependent Schrodinger equation. And to tell you the truth, we don't do much with it <laughs> because this is the uh, equation that's generally applicable for everything, but everything is a little bit too much. The states that are easy to deal with are the energy eigenstates, the stationary states. So for the stationary states, um, this operator kind of becomes like uh, uh, just a number. Because when you act with the operator, what you'll get is you'll get the same function back multiplied by its eigenvalue. So really, a lot of heavy calculations that you are expected to know how to do, that you kind of did in exam three, is uh, we use this as the starting place. That energy eigenvalue, which you can only talk about if you're dealing with the energy eigenstate or the stationary state, multiplied to the time independent wave function. Um, you might remember the relationship between from here to here, the phase factor that depends on time, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> um, that's equal to, the rest here kind of remains the same, minus h bar squared over 2m, the position derivative with respect to, well, derivative with respect to position. This time it's an ordinary derivative because there's only one variable of psi of x plus v of x, psi of x. Now, this is still not easy because a solution to this differential equation depends on what is this term. And for the purpose of this class, uh, what the only potential that you should, you are expected to be able to deal with in the sense of just deriving the solution from scratch is this, uh, um, so let's just call it Solvable. This is solvable if uh, this is piece, if uh, this is piecewise. As in, you can piece together solutions where this is a uh, piecewise uh, constant. As in, you can piece together solutions with this being a constant value. So really, all you are dealing with is take the two derivatives, you get some constant times function. Can you do that? You did that on exam, well, some of you did it on exam three. <laughs> so that's really at the level where it'll stay. And uh, as you saw it on exam three, it, it, when you are actually going through, it takes a lot of work. So if I were to put something like that on the final, then I'll have to account for the amount of time that's taking you. Um, <laughs> um, now, for any other potentials like, so we are already in chapter seven. Uh, so chapter seven does cover harmonic oscillator and you are supposed to know what harmonic oscillator is, but in terms of dealing with the actual differential equation, all I would ever ask you is take this, plug it in, show that it's a solution, find me the eigenvalue. That, that, that was your exam three. 
And once again, um, if I put, were to put something like that on the final, then I have to account for how long that takes. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so that's a kind of overview of Schrodinger equation. And you know, there were some calculation examples that you saw. Um, and there are applications of this to the infinite square well. So you should know examples like, um, so two examples you definitely should know how to do from beginning to the end is infinite square well or particle in a box. That's some, what it's sometimes called. And um, step potential. And I want SQ to deal with, with or calculation or conceptual wise. Didn't want to, to deal with it conceptually, but I don't think we did it right in this semester. There's something called a finite square well, which is calculationally more difficult. If I had a, like a mathematical assignment, I could have helped you do it, but we didn't. So these are really the two situations where uh, you need to be able to do everything from scratch, starting from here. Yeah. Infinite square is actually particularly easy one. This is something that you can do just using this. Um, and oh, oh, just so that I mention it, part of uh, applying these is applying boundary conditions. So under this situation, you can get a general solution easily to find the particular solution you have to apply boundary conditions or initial values, as you, your differential equation class might call it. Um, all right, I have a little section of the board left for chapter eight, essentially. Um, yeah, and you know, quantum tunneling, you should know what it is, but I'm not gonna ask you to do any dif uh, detailed calculation, and I'm not even going to ask you to use, so when you look at chapter seven, 7 7.6, there are these super complicated formulas. Uh, let's see, let me just scroll to it. Um, so they actually go through computation of reflection pro uh, tunneling probability. So here's two, tunneling probability in general case, tunneling probability for poorly tunneling wall. What I'll tell you is that don't bother writing this down because I'm never gonna ask you a question where these are required. Um, sort of the most you will see is what you saw in the exam three multiple choice with how does the parameters of the barrier relate to tunneling probability. Um, like the formula itself, I don't think you gain anything from using the formula. <laughs> so, um, so as long as you're able to deal with the step potential under all circumstances where energy is greater than, less than the step size, I think that's um, a good place to be. So, um, so that's, uh, okay, I have a little, this little corner for chapter eight. <laughs> um, so what I have to tell you is the biggest thing are facts about hydrogen atom um, uh, wave function. Hydrogen atom, uh, yeah, I guess wave function. And there's a lot here that, you know, not all that easy to summarize here. And I think one thing that kind of t reaches into every one of these that you ought to know is the, I, the, these four quantum numbers that specify any electron state in hydrogen atom. Quantum numbers N, L, M sub L, M sub S. In kind of knowing what this stands for naturally gets you into having to look up stuff about electron spin. So you have to know something about electron spin. And these two are both angular momenta and how they add up relates to some rud very rudimentary addition of angular momentum. Not the kind that we did in the lab, but just very rudimentary. Um, orbital quantum number, um, magnetic quantum numbers are a little bit into Zeeman effect, but not that much. Um, this is the kind of comparison. You can compare this to the Bohr model. So, oh, did I never mention the Bohr model? So I guess um, these two kind of, you can do a comparison with the Bohr model. So a lot of what you need to know in chapter eight, particularly from section 8.1, kind of gets rolled into this. Plus one more, and this is what I need to mention separately, is this, the exclusion principle. So plus poly 
exclusion principle, especially how it relates to the fermions. That's going to be important um, when we are dealing with particle physics. Um, yeah, and as I said, and as you saw in exam three, I can't really ask you any detailed calculation question out of chapter eight. Uh, the one thing that I might be able to do with, with the, the hydrogen radial function, I would give you mo most of it. Um, uh, oh, I think there's, a, before we leave this, I think there's two things that I forgot to mention. Let me just mention the words so that you don't forget. It has to do with the detailed calculation. It's calculation of, uh, so eigenvalue calculation. And expectation value or you know, expectation value of some operator calculation. These are uh, calculations for which you have, uh, you, you have calculus formulas. For this expectation value, you've seen what that is. It's an uh, integral with respect to some parameter, uh, wave function, complex conjugate, this, this. You know, calculate this integral. That's the expectation value. Yes, you remember seeing it in homework? Remember seeing it on the exam? <laughs> so this is something that you may be expected to do again. Once again, with the uh, you know um, understanding that this kind of calculation takes time, so I need to be mindful of the length. Um, so with the hydrogen atom, I could ask you for expectation value calculation as you did in one homework. But I would need to give you most of the pieces like the radial wave function. The only thing I might expect you to have remembered is the, how this integral becomes in the, um, when you do it as a radial integral of a spherical shells. Yeah, so yeah. So I think that kind of goes over everything through chapter eight. Um, questions, comments? 